Hello, so today we're going to do MS-DOS tutorial. It is a pain in the ass sometimes shooting this stuff. Um, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, I'm shooting this before I moved. I've got the Tandy set up. I just figured to do it tonight. You know, get some escapism because I've been mainly hanging around with other people most of the time. And living life and mostly just working my ass off. So anyway, let's turn this on and talk about DOS for DOS December. Computer we're on today is my Tandy 1000A. Yes, the same one I recorded that whole barrage of Septandy videos with this year. Maybe in 2024 I'll probably move to just trying to make more quality content less often. But a lot of this has been just shooting stuff for my website. Anyway, uh, this is called, let's reboot it again. This is called the Power On Self Test, and this is what most computers that you find, say you find a 486 in your attic or a 286 in the basement or whatever, um, it usually shows you a memory count, maybe the BIOS version, BIOS type, serial number, it depends. This is a Tandy 1000, so it just shows you memory size, 640K. Some of them won't even show anything at all, like the earliest IBM PCs. Here you go, we're booting up the hard drive controller. I got like a 125 meg hard drive on XTIDE on this computer. And now we're gonna get to the DOS tutorial section. We're not wasting a lot of time on this video. We're just sort of cutting it straight for people who might be interested who actually watch this channel. Because every time I think that um, I should just give up and go away, then I do and then People start inspiring me and commenting and asking me to come back and then I come back and start doing stuff and then the certain people in my life start questioning and going, hey, why are you doing this? Why aren't you making money? Do people asking you? What is wrong with doing things for fun these days? Seriously, what's wrong with you people? I want to slap the guy that made that song, every day I'm hustling, hustling. Yeah, maybe you should sit down and have something to drink and have some fun in your life for a minute and relax, dude. Anyway, I feel about the same about that song as I do about Brooke Candy with the That's what everybody does. That's what everybody does. I don't give a crap what everybody does. After all, I wouldn't have this um, hobby if uh, I did. Anyway, back on track. MS-DOS 622 startup menu. Um, this is a feature that started in MS-DOS 6 and carried over from that point onward. It's called a multi-boot config. We might talk a little bit about that, um, or I might talk about it in another video another day. I think probably another day might be better, because that's a little more technical, and this is supposed to be a rinky-dink basic MS-DOS. Well, for those of you curious, though, what all these things are for, we have Game Optimized, which is the one I use the most. It has no network, no nothing else, just straight up for games with a mouse. Over here we have a clean boot, MS-DOS 622. Over here we have MS-DOS 622 with network support. And then we have Deskmate 2 and 3, which we're just going to promptly ignore because we're just talking about DOS today. So most DOS systems will totally bypass this because it doesn't have it, and it'll just boot in. As you can see, autoexec.bat and config.sys have been processed, and now we've been dropped at the prompt. Um, that's where we will learn our first few commands. The first one I'm going to talk about here is CLS. Say your screen's too full of stuff, or you're maybe someone who's a little OCD and you don't want um, things on your screen uh, cluttered up and it's making you intense, or you're, which is kind of like me, I guess, and, or you just uh, really want to clear the screen to a clean one, you just type CLS. That stands for clear screen. This is actually where the term meme came from. Memonics, aka abbreviated ways of saying commands or terms or something. Nowadays, it just means I made a viral video of throwing cats at my ceiling fan. That's not how this works. Anyway, as you can see, CLS, now here we are, a clean DOS prompt. Now, let's just say, hypothetically, you found this computer in your basement, or your attic, or your uncle gave it to you, or your cousin gave it to you, and all you know is you have a giant beige brick that just somehow miraculously has a CMOS battery that still works, even though it's 30, 40 years old and is still displaying stuff. Uh, I can believe that really exists because, well, you know, I, I had a Gem 286 with a 30-year-old CMOS battery that still worked. There's one of those bloody Varda batteries that leaks too. Go figure. Anyway, the first command, it, 
you want to find out what version of MS-DOS you have because some of the later commands we might talk about both in this video and later videos might depend on your version of DOS. VR. So you can see it says MS-DOS version 622. This is Microsoft DOS. Um, PC DOS originally was Microsoft DOS licensed to IBM, but it later split off on its own after IBM and Microsoft split over OS 2. And it was always kind of its own different character from about MS PC DOS and MS DOS 5 onward. You also had DR DOS, which was digital research. Um, that sounds familiar. Well, if you've watched old episodes of the Computer Chronicles, you probably have seen the uh, one of the main men from digital research, Gary Kildall, uh, talking and hanging around with uh, Stuart Chaffe. So. Now that we know what version MS-DOS we have here, not like we already didn't know because I had that menu earlier on that not everybody has that we'll probably talk about in another video. Um, now that we know what version of DOS we have, now let's get into some of the basic commands. Usually the first thing that'll help you find out what's going on with your computer is DIR, which is directory. And what it does is it lists the contents of a directory out onto the screen, kind of like this. So you can see it lists the file name, whether it's uh, the file extension, then whether it's a directory, if it's a file, it's blank. Then how many bytes the file is. And then um, the date and then the time. And um, actual 12 hour format in this version. Some of them use 24 hour military time format. So as you can see, the last file there, for example, is a file, desktop.config. It is 135, um, 135 bytes in size, 0. It was uh, 6 22 2023 when this was put on here. Yeah, that was when I was messing around with it, and it was at 9.56 p.m. So that gives you an idea, and of course, after the DIR command, it tells you how many files are in the directory. Mind you, not folders, all those DIRs are folders, not files. So 26 files, you got 65,448 bytes in there total, so that's about um, 65 kilobytes. And you have 57 million, 71,000, 71,616 bytes free, which means we have 57 megabytes or 56 megabytes free on this uh, 100 megabyte hard drive that's in the standee. Um, that's very useful to know too, especially if you're working with original low capacity hard drives, so you can figure out whether you can fit the darn game on there or software or whatever you're doing. Most people doing this are doing gaming, but you know. Now we'll talk about another concept, command line switches. So, um, Every, not every, but most MS-DOS commands have switches that change the way they function. The R command is no exception. Um, you have basically switches be, you know, they either begin with a slash like this, or a hyphen like that, or a, could be just, you know, that. And it just depends on how it's written, how the files are done. Check your readme files or help files or whatever else on here. So right now we're going to use one that shows all the contents of this folder across the width of the screen, dir slash w, which you know is one of my favorites for this. This is a better command to use if you're looking for specific files in the directory of a specific type, which we will get to in a minute. Since uh, maybe say you're someone completely new to retro computing, completely new to MS-DOS, and completely new to figuring out how to run any of this stuff. So this is a very useful command to have. As you can see, it now shows all of my directories and files in the root of the C drive right there across the screen where you can see them all one fell swoop. Another way to do this, if you need more details, you can do slash P, which is page. That's how you remember that one. W stands for width, P stands for page. There you go. It's dir slash P, you hit enter, and as you can see, there was too much to fill the screen last time, but so when it fills the screen, it says press key to continue, and then you press the key to continue and by any key it doesn't mean you look for a key that says any on it it means any key on the keyboard will do enter space bar m q p f maybe not the function keys but that should give you an idea so let's say um we want to go ahead and navigate some directories here well there's a few different ways of doing this and it's all using a command called cd for a change directory so if we just type cd, it just shows you what directory we're currently in. You probably consider it current directory. Type cd, cd, um, slash uh, Sierra here, which I might mention while we're doing this, there are some directories you will probably want to look for. 
Um, some of them would be C slash DOS, which is always going to be there on a DOS system, unless it's a completely stripped out system and somebody just went ahead and put the startup files from a boot disk on there. Sierra is a good one if it has some Sierra games on it. Games is another one to look for. Um, all these my Tandy has. So we're going to go to the DOS directory first. So C slash DOS is where all your actual programs, think of it as kind of like CD slash Windows on a modern system. As you can see, we can also combine these two uh, switches together because there's too many files in the DOS directory to actually see everything on one screen, even with slash P. Now let's take a look at this screen. If you look up top, a trib.exe, that's one type of file to look for for an executable that actually does something. Another type is a .com, like help.com. Um, another type to look for is a batch file, which I'll show you how we can locate the batch files in here in a minute. Um, as you can see, uh, artillery.bat right there on about one, two, three, four, five, six down on the far left. That's uh, the batch file for my uh, DOS game for artillery. And then we press enter and there we go. Everything that's in that directory, we have seven megabytes total, about eight. And that kind of shows you everything that's in the DOS directory. Um, now let's talk about the kinds of files that these files are. So exe files are executable files. And what they do is they run programs. And Another type of file like that is com, which does not stand for commercial, which it does now as a part of a web address. No, back in the DOS days, before the World Wide Web, it was meant command, which is another executable file type. And last but certainly not least, and I'm going to show you another uh, subset of the DIR command here in a minute, is a batch file. A batch file is just a plain text file. It's like a script. It's like... Uh, it's kind of like a Visual Basic or Auto Hotkey script for MS-DOS. What it what does is it allows you to automatically execute commands, set environment variables, do all that fun stuff and script it all so you can just use one, one little file to kick off an entire series of events. One fine example is the one we see in, uh, by going back by typing cd slash, which will take you back one directory, is dir autoexec.bat. And this is how you isolate files using the dir command. You can do dir star dot bat, this uh, star character over here, that, that's a wild card. And that'll allow you to show all the files called dot bat in the folder, which of course there's only one here, auto exec. And um, yeah, now let's uh, go ahead and go find another folder that has something in it. So. You can change directories by doing cd slash backslash and then the directory name. But I think we'll show another way. You can also skip it. The difference is if I went back here using cd slash, um, we could go completely up to say the King's Quest directory by just typing that, the full field. But you have to have the backslash just to do that. So here you go. And then. We're in the King's Quest directory, and as we can see here, we've got uh, a Sierra.com file. And I'm going to kind of just introduce you to various concepts in here. Say so you're looking at these games in Sierra, you see in the Sierra folder, uh, look, always look for a file that says Sierra.exe or Sierra.com. It'll allow you to launch the game. So that's another way that you can uh, try and launch a game in DOS. Um, is looking for uh, .com, .bat, or .exe files. You can see we also have a King's Quest 1.bat file up there also. So, you know, that's kind of the basics of running stuff here. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, what these plain text files actually look like on the inside. There's a way you can edit files in DOS. Um, any kind of plain text file. Um, types of files that you usually see that are plain text like that are .cfg, dot bat or even um yeah that's about it config files and batch files so let's go ahead and take a look at this king's quest one dot bat file now in dos there are two command line editors that you can use one we're not going to talk about which is edlin because i'm not very familiar with it and i don't use it i usually just copy dos edit over and use that the other one is edit. You just type edit and then underscore kq1.bat. And there you go.
and it'll take it a moment because this is a really slow 4.77 megahertz MS DOS computer. <laughs> All right, so here we are in edit, and yes, it's in black and white. I'm seeing it in color. And so here we go. Um, if you look at this batch, this is a batch file, and so what it does is it runs uh, the King's Quest One executable because there's probably another secondary executable in there that does that and then it does all these x2 x3 x4 x5 whatever that means and yes i have a mouse on this tandy i'm um, in here of course you can access file by clicking on it or edit this is just like a windows program or you can do it by hitting alt or alt f to bring up the full menu and as you can see we can start a new file we can open a file we can save we can save as we can print it to the non-existent printer and we can even exit, which is the most important thing we're going to talk about in various programs here. Um, you can also do all the regular stuff. This is basically Notepad for DOS. I think I should have mentioned that right off the bat. This is like Notepad for MS-DOS. It allows you to edit plain text files, and by plain text files, it means text files like this, where it's just, you know, this is a plain text file. You can also save it now. Oh, shoot. Well, we'll just exit out. And then you can hit tab to change between these different menus here, as you can see. So we're not going to save it and exit out. And we're going to talk about um, running certain programs and escaping out of them in common ways are done. Let's take a look at maybe uh, King's Quest. Let's take a look at King's Quest, King's Quest here. You can exit out of this from a menu bar. This is like the easiest kind of programs to deal with in DOS. So we'll just exit out to the main menu, the main beginning of the game here. Give it a minute. And then we'll just exit out by uh, going to file. You hit escape, go to file and quit. That's how you get out of most of these uh, Sierra graphical adventure games. Um, another way of escaping a program, let's go to DOS and then do hit artillery.bat. Uh, yeah. yeah, let's uh, let's run a basic program in a minute here. Another way you can stop execution is you can do control Z, control C. You can also do uh, Control Alt Delete, which does a soft reboot of the computer. Um, other ones to try would be like Control Q or Control E. Control E is what I use in, you know, like Ultima. Control Q works in other programs. Um, other common escape keys include F10 or F12 in the case of Deskmate. So that should give you kind of an idea of the way to get out of a program because that's one of the most important ways. And when in doubt, you can hit the reset button or control alt delete and just reboot because a lot of DOS programs work like that. Now we're going to talk about the next part of this. Another thing that you probably should know is Microsoft Basic because Microsoft Basic, no, this is not a programming tutorial, which is what most people use Basic for is programming. As you can see, I have a pile of .bass files up here. These are all DOS games in basic. Um, Gorillas.basic is one of the most popular. We're going to do depth charge, um, which is like a missile game. So you can run these basic games. The easiest way is uh, to run it is just to type basic A and then open the file name. This is another common way you open files in DOS programs is by typing the file name after the executable. And we have Advanced Basic for the Tandy 1000 here, and we have Depth Charge by Henry J. Kotler right here. Yes, it'd be nice if it was in color, but then you couldn't see the text. But it also works well in black and white, for the most part. Anyway, this is an old uh, game for Basic right here. And as you can see, you can uh, do instructions. I'm going to say no. And as you can see, it looks kind of like WordPerfect 5.1 uh, having some kind of submarine war. Now let's just say we want to exit out of this. We can hit Control Z, or we can hit Control C, or Control Q, or we can just escape. 
Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and reboot real quick here and show you how to get out of basic. I'll be right back. Now let's just say um, you wanna get into just basic by itself. You type basic A. This is one version of basic that you can get into. You can also um, hit F3 to load a file. And then, um, as you can see, it loads at depthcharge.basic, and you can list all the source code from it right here, as you can see. And there it's showing you all the uh, source code for Henry J. Kotler's uh, depth charge game right here, printed down the screen. There's a lot of source code in this game, let me tell you. Yeah, so that's what a basic game looks like on the inside. It too is a plain text file. That's all this is. Now we're gonna see um, what happens here as it uh, just flies through all 1800, 1900. How many? There we go. One, roughly over a thousand lines of code there. Anyway, let's go ahead and um, try and make this more visible. So we'll go to screen two or screen three. Okay, and then this is kind of like an easy one. If you want to get out of basic, which you can tell if you're in basic, because it'll say one list, two run, all that other stuff. This is a special Tandy mode, I think. Or no, this is the low res CGA mode everybody uses. Anyway, to get out of basic, you just type system. Another similar one would be uh, G, uh, would be uh, Q basic, which is quick basic. That's the later version that you use on here. Um, that's the one gorillas.bass is used on. So this is not a demonstration of games. We're gonna kind of stay away from that stuff. Um, another program, maybe you're more used to uh, more used to running stuff. Starting with DOS four and higher, you have DOS shell right here. This is a graphical shell for MS DOS that um, actually allows you to kind of handle it. It's kind of like Windows 3.1 File Manager. Um, so as you can see, we're booting it up and on the uh, Tandy 1000. And it's going to take a few moments as we're on this pokey 4.77 megahertz v20. This is if you need an easier way to program files or create different stuff. And it's going to take it a few moments. There we go. So here we are. We're in DOS shell. It's going to calculate up the contents of our hard drive here. So you can see it's going really slow because this is, you know, you know. So, as you can see here, we have a lot of files on this Tandy, so it's going to take it a few minutes to kind of pull all this through right here. And, um, yeah, this is a useful program if you're not quite used to file management in MS-DOS. Um, and it could be a good thing. You don't want to make it a crutch because, you know, if you get on an even older system such as this, this kind of shows why you don't want to make it a crutch crutch because it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to do this on a much uh, much easier to deal with this program on a much faster system like a, you know a 286 or better this is actually designed for a 286 or better but it'll run on an 8088 Microsoft says it won't but it does so there you go about 2,000 files on here and um, as we can see here well you can't really see my mouse cursor but uh, yeah there we go you can kind of see it there so if we go up here, um, as you can see, me scooting around a little bit, there's our various drives. You have A, B, and C. You can also tab through the windows to change uh, the active thing. So down here is like your program list, which includes command prompt, MS-DOS editor, QBasic, and even your disk utilities like disk copy, antivirus, backup, quick format, format, undelete. Um, we might talk about this more in depth, but I just kind of wanted to show you that. You can also discover it. Of course, Alt-F will allow you to get out of here. You can change the view. You can change the tree. Um, this kind of explains the concept of files and folders, so maybe we'll go in here for a moment. So this is called a drive right here. See, in DOS, almost all drives, like I mentioned, have a drive letter. Um, this is C. A and B are my floppy drives. These are directories. Just like folders that you see in Windows, it's just the MS-DOS version of it. So let's take a look at the um, 
adjust mem thing, which was like a memory adjustment utility. So say we're in this folder and we tab over here, these are your files. So you have an assembly language file, you have a command, and you have the zip file that's in there. If I want to delete it, I just hit delete on the keyboard and it should let it delete the file. And then you just confirm by pressing yes and there you go, we uh, deleted a file. Um, of course to escape, you go Alt F and uh, exit and there we go. Now, let's just say you're on this computer, you maybe put some games on it, let's wait for this to go out, and you need to find out what is in your computer, or what kind of computer you have. Now, of course it's obvious, I know what this computer is. Tandy 1000, 640K RAM, it's the 1000A model actually, with the NECV20 in it, and 8087, and CGA, and all that. But well, let's just say you're starting out and you don't really know what kind of hardware your computer has. Microsoft DOS has a really useful utility here called MSD. When you type it, uh, what it'll do is it'll take account for all the hardware inside of your computer, and it will uh, let you know what you've got for a processor, for memory. So you can see it's scanning the system right now. Um, on this, it'll be really pokey and slow because it's a Tandy with uh, 4.77 megahertz uh, V20 in it. So we're just sort of bloop, 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 bloop. Yeah, I haven't gotten up the guts to try EV Blogs Turbo Board and try and roll one of my own yet. Anyway, we're gonna just kind of sit here and wait. It's still bleeping its hard drive and looking for stuff. I wonder why I recorded using the Tandy. It's because I can get full screen with the Tandy and I don't have all these uh, problems trying to demonstrate all this to you on another machine. We might use some other computers too as I figure my recording rig out a little more. So as you can see, we have a whole list of stuff in here in, um, in MSD. Right here, you have your computer. This tells you your BIOS, your CPU, and um, some other high-end info. This tells you how much memory you have, in this case, 624K. Um, sometimes MSD will give us erroneous things like the 65535K. There is no chance that a Tandy 1000 with a V20 or an 8088 has 64 megabytes of RAM. That's like 486 numbers there, which is actually a maximum amount of RAM, but that's because it just doesn't know what the hell to do with it. Video CGA unknown, pretty much your standard CGA. If I had networking going, I'd have my networking uh, infrastructure type here. It'd be you know, like Microsoft Network Client, Microsoft LAN Manager, Novell Netware. That would appear there. OS version, mouse. It says not detected, but obviously I'm using my Tandy Deluxe mouse here. Other adapters, uh, in this case just shows a game adapter, my disk drives and the specs on those. LPT port in DOS, that means your printer port or parallel port, which is also used for things like CD-ROMs and stuff more often nowadays, uh, backpack CD-ROMs and things like that. But uh, back in the day, this is generally called your printer port because it's usually what your printer connected to. COM ports, uh, you'll see both those little DB9 and DB25 serial ports in here, or you will also see um, your modem listed in here usually as well if you have a modem. I don't have a modem in any of my computers. I don't use modems anymore. No landline to use them with. Windows, of course, this is a Tandy 1000, no Windows. If you had like Windows version 3.11 or Windows 95 in here, it would pick up on the string for the OS and print it out there. IRQ stats, that's interrupts, that's techie stuff. TSR programs, that's also techie stuff. And device adapters. Basically, this is your interrupt request lines. We may take a look at that real quick. Terminate stay resident programs. Those are just programs that terminate in memory, but they stay there. And then there's your device drivers, which is things like the Joy.sys that's driving this Tandy Deluxe mouse. Let's take a look at the basics. So here we have computer. Uh, obviously, it says Tandy. Uh, it's got a Phoenix BIOS. We'll tell you the BIOS version. I have a 01.0100 .01 BIOS version. It's an IBM PC category, so it falls in that IBM PC, uh, PC XT category. If it was an XT clone type device, it'd say PC XT, and if it was, you know, like a 286 or higher, it'd say PC AT. BIOS ID bytes are FF, BIOS state, 3585. Hmm, well, this computer, uh, it's like uh, one day before my wife's birthday in 1985. Not her birth year. 
I'm not going to reveal her age, but I'm going to reveal that, yeah, uh, I guess maybe, maybe that's why she likes this one. Eh, anyway, without the personal touch, let's move on. Processor, any CV20 or V30? Well, obviously this is a V20, it's an 8088, <laughs> originally. Um, I have the 8087 Mathco processor in here. Um, the keyboard is non-enhanced, Tandy proprietary keyboard. Of course, being a 1000A with a memory expansion as DMA, no cascaded IRQ2, just to explain that for the people interested in techie stuff on IBM PCAT286 and later. IRQ2 is usually wired up to like uh, IRQ9, and sort of like a cascade, kind of like uh, the way you cascade guitar pedals into an amp. And then the biostate segment, data segment, there isn't one. Memory here, um, this is about all that would be relevant to you for now, so 640K, always look at that first number. If it's a 286 or later, this number becomes relevant and it'll be smaller, it'll be like 4096K or 1024K or 7808K or whatever. For video, we have CGA, unknown. Um, sometimes this will show your manufacturer, uh, the graphics mode it's in. Right now we're in 80 by 25 column text mode on CGA. Visa support if you have like a 486 or newer. Um, some of these have a secondary adapter, like some old IBMs would have like an MDA and a CGA card in them. Uh, let's go take a look at some other stuff. Here's the version info for MS-DOS. Uh, conventional memory, it shows uh, the environment strings. Um, here's my mouse. Um, Here's my game, other adapters. It says I have a game adapter, which is really just my uh, mouse. You notice my mouse stopped working after that, of course. This is kind of the uh, effective, useful stuff for MSD. Now we're gonna kind of jump on some final bits of MS-DOS basics and kind of talk about uh, setup programs and other important things that you might need to know uh, starting out with an MS-DOS machine. All right, so now we're back in regular MS-DOS here and we're gonna talk about setup programs because you're gonna run into this with some games and software and various stuff. And we're gonna talk about um, maybe escaping programs and stuff. Anyway, let's get started. Um, let's just say maybe let's go to Sierra KQ4 and then let's run uh, install in here. Or actually, you want to try and find a setup file, maybe. Because uh, most games from about 1987 or later, a lot of them will have a setup program where you set the display adapter, the sound card type, your your uh, controllers, all that kind of stuff. King's Quest 4 is one that I know that has it, so we'll demonstrate that. So let's start off, uh, we'll do a dir slash w. You don't even need the space on it. And as you can see, we're going to look through here. Um, if you see the .drv files, those are driver files. So like you see, we have one for the Tandy keyboard and Tandy 320 graphics. And then we wait any day now, here we go. And then as you can see in here, there's some, uh, as you can see in here, we have some files a file called install.exe. So we'll run that. You're gonna find that a lot of files in MS-DOS for config are gonna be install.exe, setup.exe. You might have an install.bat that might do it, but it'll usually kick off a secondary thing. Um, that's a popular one for like the SSI Dungeons and Dragons games and for games that use, you know, uh, certain sound systems. Anyway, we're just gonna do install. This is just a fairly typical Sierra installer. Um, we're gonna take a look at it. And then we're gonna just kinda walk you through the uh, way of configuring a MS-DOS program using the configuration. Now this is also the same program used to install the game, but you know, as you can see, it says uh, 3D Adventures before I use for your graphics and sound, but only if you cor correctly specify the type of hardware that's installed in your computer. Okay, so we're gonna enter here. So we're gonna talk about graphic standards and what they mean. Just so then if you encounter any of this in a while and you wanna configure your computer, you can uh, tell. So as you can see, CGA two colors. Um, I'm not exactly why that's there. I'm not even too familiar with it. Um, please disregard CGA with an RGB monitor. 
This is four colors. This is the common color scheme that you usually see where it's like magenta, cyan, white, and black. Um, the stereotypical four color CGA. You'd pick this if you had like an IBM PC XT or an IBM PC with a CGA card in it. Some of them will have like MDA for monochrome display adapter or whatever, or Hercules, uh, which was like a monochrome card capable of graphics. Let's move on. Uh, EGA VGA. Sometimes this will be separate, sometimes it'll be the same one. In the case of the Sierra game, given as it's an SEI 1 game, a Sierra Creative Interpreter 1 game, it's going to be limited to 16 colors total um, in this mode. Um, regardless of whether you pick EGA or VGA. Sometimes we'll list them separately and put it as 16 colors. It'll be like a 320 by 200 pixel screen, 16 color graphics, you've probably seen it. That's the standard for this one. Sometimes uh, they need a special driver for the IBM model 25 and 30. They had sort of a special in between EGA and VGA called MCGA or multicolor graphics array. MCGA, which is also the same one used for the VGA up here if you were running in 256 colors. VGA and uh, MCGA are capable of 256 colors at 320 by 200 resolution. And lastly, we have the one that we have here, the Tandy 1000 with an RGB monitor, which is exactly what we're using. I've got my Multisync 2 JC1402 HWA uh, CRT hooked up to this. That's what I'm looking at, not at this. So we'll select this one. Um, this also sometimes will say Tandy 1000 and PC Junior. They use the same video standard. It's basically an enhanced form of CGA capable of 320 by 200 at uh, 16 colors, just like uh, this is capable of 256, but it's not full VGA. So there you go. Hopefully that explains it well enough to at least guide you through some game setup. So we'll select Tandy 1000 because this is a Tandy 1000, so it's obvious what it is. We know what it is. Um, now we're going to talk about sound cards real quick. Um, when in doubt, always pick AdLib. Um, at least on anything that's not a Tandy 1000. When in doubt, pick AdLib, or if, when really in doubt, pick this one. IBM PC compatible internal speaker. This is the oldest one that you're going to run into. Every computer, every IBM compatible, every PC up to a current Core i5 has an internal speaker in it, usually. Or some way of blipping codes. Um... IBM PC, your compatible internal speaker, of course, that's your mono, one bleeper, the one that sounds like, uh, sounds like, um, sounds like a kitchen timer trying to beatbox, you know, you know, that kind of shit. Um, over here you have a AdLib music synthesizer card. This is that famous, um, Yamaha OPL FM synthesizer. When in doubt, and you know the computer has a sound card, try this, because most likely it will have an FM synthesizer in there. Um, and just leave it at the default settings, and it'll usually work just fine. Um, AdLib sound cards are probably the most common thing in a 286 or later. On a Tandy 1000 like this, we don't have that. IBM Music Feature Card, if you want to look that up, go look up LGR. He has a great video on the uh, extremely rare, extremely expensive, um, finance-killing, uh, collectible IBM Music Feature Card. It's kind of a rare piece. I think only Sierra games were only one of the types of games to support that. Another one to see LGR or, you know, maybe 8-bit guy for is a Roland MP32 sound module. I'd probably say Clint would be better, you know, LGR, because, you know, he has a MT32 setup, I believe. I don't have one on any of my computers. And right here in the middle is what we've got right now. The IBM PC Junior Tandy 1000 internal uh, speaker. Basically, the Tandy 1000 and the IBM PC Junior both have this programmable interrupt timer in here, and it's erroneously called three voice. This is the fourth voice, secret fourth voice, of the Tandy PC Junior three voice circuit. So you have three square wave channels plus a fourth from this, and that's the one we will be selecting. Now we're going to talk about, um, real quick, uh, this one asks what kind of keyboard you have. If you have a Tandy 1000, you'll probably need a special driver to use that keyboard. Be aware there are some vintage MS-DOS systems with funky keyboards, and the Tandy 1000 is one of them. Um, another one like that is the AT&T PC, I think it's like... PC 1300 or 3100 or whatever the heck it is. It's a rebranded Olivetti. So, you know, you have those. 
Most of the time you'll be picking this one though, the uh, IBM Personal Computer Compatible Keyboard. We'll pick Tandy 1000 for this one. And then last but not least, uh, you can pick, well not last, is the joystick. Um, if you have a compatible joystick, uh, pick yes. I don't have one and I'm not going to use one, even though I have the Tandy 1000 ports, which will work for that, so I'm going to put it as no. And last and finally, do you have a Microsoft compatible mouse? Well, here we go. I do have one. And it's selected via that um, field there. Oh yeah, and uh, be careful of the hold key on the Tandy 1000. So we'll select yes to that. And so here we got it. You wish to install this game. And remember, do not rush through these prompts. Please read everything because you could overwrite files and make mistakes. There's one thing I must remind you about MS-DOS. It is not a hand-holding operating system. There's no magical wizard who's going to pop up in the corner of your screen. And honestly, if there was that wizard, he'd be Mananananananananan, whatever the heck his name is from King's Quest Three, And he'd probably try to turn you into a dog the minute you tried to do something he didn't like. So, anyway, here it says, please press escape. Since sorry on the hard drive, we'll hit escape. And then we're going to conclude with a few more file management things here, just to get you done. So, file management um, in DOS, let's say uh, I installed this game from a zip drive from my own personal FTP. Um, say we want to free up some disk space. Well, we'll use DEL. And it stands for delete. And then we'll put kq4.zip. And there we go. Let's go to temp. Let's say I wanted to, to create a few files. Um, uh, let's say if I had a folder full of a bunch of files, I can do dl start star to completely delete the folder. Maybe I want to just delete all the uh, save game files in there. I just put, you know, star.save or star.cfg star if I'm starting over with a config. So all the same tricks that work with DIR work with uh, delete. And that's just one of the things that's kind of, these are the kind of things that are useful to know in DOS. And of course, let's talk about one last thing here. Let's talk about floppy disks. Because, you know, we haven't talked about floppies yet. Now we have two drives in this Tandy 1000 here. We have a 360K double-sided, double-density um, drive A and a 360K double-density, double-sided drive B. These are the five and a quarter inch uh, full-size drives. Now does this mean a five and a quarter inch floppy drive is always a 360 kilobyte drive? No. Actually, if it's a 286 or later, there's a pretty good chance that's probably got a 1.2 megabyte drive in there. You can check your bio settings or use MSD to find that out. But to change drive letters, you just type the drive letter and then a colon like that. So we'll go to the A drive and take a look around. And what is in my A folder? Well, right here we have um, a game called Dino, which is a dinosaur game. If we move to the B drive, like that, we can do dir slash w on the B drive, and here we have an old version of Deskmate that we might want to use. Um, so you can go to A, B drive, you can run desk from here, and this will launch the Deskmate um, software. And as you can see right here, um, there it is with all the regular letterhead and all that other basic stuff, and exit out, we'll hit F12. It'll just drop us back out to the B drive. Um, let's just say, um, let's finalize this video with a game. We'll go back to the A drive. Um, first off, let me let me show you some other stuff that you might not want to uh, do the panic. Let's say you do DIR on drive with no disk in it, like this. I'm only going to do this once. As you can see, not ready, error reading drive B. If you don't have a floppy disk in there, you have a floppy disk in there that you don't need, or a floppy disk in there that's unreadable, it's gonna throw up this message. Your best way to go about it is to abort or fail. Most likely I just hit abort. If you try retry, it tries to reread. Or you can do fail, and then current drive is no longer valid, so you go to A. And then we can do dir slash w on drive A. 
And as we can see here, we have this dino game. Um, we can try and run it here. And it'll start loading the game off a of floppy disk. And there's no shame in running games off of floppy disks. Actually, certain games require it. And as you can see, it just kicks me back to the prompt because this is a booter game. Now, um, we're going to go ahead and um, do one last thing here. Um, I'm going to show you the format command uh, real quick because I have some blank floppies in here that I might want to format, you know, use for some stuff. And um, in order to do that, we'll need a blank floppy disk. So we'll put a blank disk in drive A, and this is what we're going to finish with. Maybe say you need to make a system disk, um, you can do format A colon, A colon, and it'll format the A drive. You can also do a slash S for, for system, if you want to put system files on it. We're just going to format the A drive. And then on old, newer computers, it'll usually find know the drive type, and it'll just automatically compensate. Sometimes you might have to use some other stuff, but that's outside the scope for this. But we're just going to format a floppy disk, and I'm going to get you familiar with it real quick before we finish this video. As you can see, it checks later DOSs, uh, check and save unformat information on the drive. This one, we don't need to do that. Verifying 360 kilobytes, and here we go. We're formatting a floppy drive. And it'll tell you how many percent, and it takes uh, some time to do. It's actually not too bad on this Tandy 1000. It actually formats pretty quick. So here you go. 55, 56, 7, 58, 59, 60, you know, see. And we formatted the disk. Format complete. And then you can put in a volume label. So I do, you know, blank disk. So you can do that, or you can just completely skip the label entirely and just hit enter. And as you can see, we have 362,496 bytes total and um, the volume serial number. And um, asks to format another, you press no. And here we are. We will go ahead and do a dir slash w on this. And there we are. No files in that directory. We're going to go back to C and we're going to finish this uh, craziness up. So. Hopefully this has been helpful to any of you who want to get started using a retro computer with MS-DOS or even this stuff even works in DOSBox. If you want to use DOSBox, um, that totally works there as well. So hopefully this kind of helps. Um, if I make some new video, more videos of this, we're going to talk about things like file management and um, file management and we might get a little more into some of the DOS utilities and some of the more advanced stuff, maybe some computer technicals. We'll see. Um, I just, hopefully this has been helpful to someone. Um, this is CreepyNet signing out. See you in the next video.